thank you and welcome to um, my part of the pop biochap presentation. Um, I'm having to rug up a bit because I've come from um, not so sunny Queensland, but it's 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 a little bit warmer there than this part of the world, so I'm feeling it a little. Um, my little friend up there um, is an Amazonian um, green tree frog. Um, there's a reason I have an Amazonian tree frog. Tree frog. Tree frog. Um, the area where he is from is where the the, the Terra Preta soils were found, um, and there's that sort of linking. So, and he's a beautiful <coughs> little creature. Um, wait. Um, my journey, um, which I'm going to cover to start with, um, this is my property day one. Uh, this is my, um, I have a seven and a half acre property and I have an area which I developed um, as a half acre, a um, couple of fruit trees to start. Um, I, did a, uh, I, I did a gardening course or a series of gardening courses with a, um, a very enthusiastic um, gardening teacher um, and then during those courses, um, and they're amazing courses, um, there's so much to learn. Um, the, the Terra Preta soils and the Amazon came up um, and we talked a lot about permaculture. Um, after that I did my, my PDC or permaculture design certificate um, in, in or near to Noosa. Um, um, Noosa has one of the largest permaculture groups um, in the world um, and their monthly meetings are often up to 150 members. Um, so from permaculture circle, that's quite an amazing number to have each month. Uh, very enthusiastic, and wonderful, grounded group of people. Um, very early, early on, um, I, I was quite familiar with um, the term biochar with regards to what I was doing. Um, and what I was doing at, at those very, very early stages was extremely primitive um, and and the odd third degree burn and losing hair quite regularly um, because of how I was doing it. Um, it, it. It's a very common thing with people who get involved with, with, with biochar to, to notice that the, the lack of hair on the arms and uh, uh, I, I like to, ha to have a, a, at least a three or four day growth when I'm, when I'm sort of designing things because it's usually a good indicator of when you're too close to something that's really hot, it starts to burn. Um, so. I, I took a big leap and um, I, I, I did take the, the web domain biochar.net because that was my blog um, and, and my, my journey. And then I jumped in a car and drove from Brisbane to, um, to Sydney. So that's sort of a, an eight, nine hour drive. Um, and at that stage I was a, um, a learning gardener. Um, I knew a little bit about biochar and here I was at a conference with 150 of the world's leading soil scientists um, and feeling just a little bit of a little bit out of my depth but I got got used to that and as I was sort of staggering around looking where to go I happened to come across two other um, Kiwis who are staggering around looking where to go and we ended up sitting at the ta same table and and the, the friendship started with, with, with Alf and myself. So, um, this is my food forest now. Um, I've applied uh, biochar um, on, a, on a huge rate in, 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 into my soils. Um, I'm sort of not doing a, the classic sort of science of having one one plot trial for 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 my for my garden without biochar and one plot with I've put biochar everywhere. I'm under the uh, well, the journey of creating my own terra preta soils. Um, after uh, about seven years, I've noticed that the soils that I'm working with, which are sandy loam over a horrible clay, um, are actually turning black. They are quite visually black. The, 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 the early char that I was putting in um, has actually start, is starting to stabilise, so it actually breaks down from its its um, its crumbly state, and the the, 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 the the soil in my veggie garden around my fruit trees. I have 125 fruit trees in here. I have four major veggie garden beds throughout throughout the area. 16 um, individual clumps of bananas, 
um, and this produces most of my food. So um, I'm sort of putting it out there with, with biochar, but it's all done organically um, and under permaculture principles, um, chop and drop um, and composting. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go into that, um, how I work that in with biochar. Um, the, the property is contour swaled, um, all water that, that comes into the property is pacified and, and instead of moving through my property in, in 10 minutes, it usually takes about three weeks. We have a similar sort of rainfall to here, um, but the difference is I get six months of rainfall in half an hour. So uh, it's, it's, it's really important in this sort of environment to, to hold and pacify the water in the landscape for as long as possible. So um, the, the, the addition of biochars and its moisture holding capacity has been a real benefit to, to, to my growing. And we go through dry cycles um, and wet cycles in this environment. We're currently in a wet cycle, so everything's growing amazingly well. Um, a, a, a dry cycle is a 10 year dry cycle and then a, a wet cycle is a five year wet cycle so we're in we're sort of coming towards the end of a, of a wet cycle um, maybe we'll find out the long term forecasts next year um, oh, I'll touch on some of these um, I, I have played with um, some primitive early forms of, of biochar production um, the development of what I call my Gibber projects, gas ignition biochar battery reactor, um, or as my neighbour like to call it, calls it the bomb. Um, it, it's a um, dangerous, scary, monster sort of machine. Um, and, um, but I'm a, I'm a bit of a pyromaniac and I, I enjoy playing with that sort of thing. Uh, I met Two, two developers, well, one, one businessman and another technology developer in Victoria, um, just out of Melbourne, at, uh, near Bendigo, um, and a guy called Russell Burnett. Russell Burnett was involved with um, large scale, a larger scale device, um, and I've got some images of his continuous flow pyrolysis system, um, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, I've since um, moved away from um, that, that style of technology and I've taken back the company that I started so I'm just the sole, sole entity of, of it so uh, I get to make all the decisions and then have to do them. Um, I, I do uh, university projects uh, with uh, Queensland University um, and the DPI, um, uh, Queensland um, Department of Ag. There's, there's a whole host of projects going all on throughout Australia um, and I'm, I'm doing more and more with those sort of groups. What is biochar? Uh, biochar is um, a high fixed carbon. You know, there's a few different ways of sort of explaining that. One is it's a recalcitrant carbon or it's a, um, a carbon which is stable in the environment or once it's applied into soils. Um, it is an Biochar is, is designed for, for agricultural or horticultural application. Um, charcoal manufacturer um, is, is it's a similar type of product, but it is designed as a fuel product or there's different areas where, where that, that material is designed. But biochar is designed for horticultural application and how it's made um, is, is focused in on maximising the carbon or maximising the material that you're producing for horticultural application. Um, there's, there's multiple ways of making, making biochar, and I'll cover those in, um, shortly. Um, this is an electron microscope image um, of, a, of a grain of hardwood uh, biochar. So it's incredibly porous. The, the, a gram of, of biochar um, can have a surface area up to three or four hundred square metres, it's quite immense. Um, this creates microbial, uh, I've called it a soil reef, um, a, a microbe hotel. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, coin sort of phrases, but it does create um, a, a structure in the soil um, which is a, a benefit for, for, for microbial and fungal life. Mm -hmm. 
one of the one of the big benefits of of, of biochar is it holds nutrient in, in the soil. So if you've got a lot of water coming through your system and you have a lot of leaching, uh, and this can be in conventional farming, it can be in organic farming, um, it, it holds nitrogen um, and various other nutrients in place, but the bonds are quite weak and they readily exchange those nutrients with plants. Um, I've done trials and I've got the trials up on the table there for you to have a look at. Um, so it's, it's quite, quite remarkable how well it exchanges nutrients um, with, with plants. I have a, um, a friend of mine, she's a, um, one of the leading seed scientists in Australia and she sort of said, said to me, um, um, plant roots love biochar. She sort of said, sees it over and over again um, with the research, research that she's doing. Um, some of the benefits um, which the New South Wales DPI are doing is um, nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, nitrous oxide is, I think, 200 and I can't remember the, the exact um, percentage, or 200, over 200 times worse in, in our, in our uh, atmosphere um, than CO2. It, it's, a, it's a really nasty greenhouse gas. Same, same with meth methane. Um, and in, in various soils, research um, has been shown with bio, biochar being incorporated into them, uh, the, 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 the nitrous oxide emissions have uh, dropped dramatically. Um, this varies in, in the different types of soils around the world because that the, every, different, every different soil you deal with is essentially a different set of, of chemicals or, or mineral compounds. So the chemical reactions which happen, and they are horrendously complex, um, differ. Uh, but in, in, in a lot of um, research that has gone on, the nitrous oxide emissions have dropped, dropped dramatically. And um, Elf, Elf um, I'm sure you're going to cover that with regards to um, uh, the um, cattle. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, Elf will touch on that a little bit as well. Um, just to just step back, when a, when a tree grows, it absorbs, it, it absorbs carbon into it a, a, as it grows. When that tree dies and, and, and starts to decompose, that, that, that carbon is re-released into the atmosphere. That is known as the normal carbon cycle. Um, the idea of, of biochar is we take that biomass, and if that, that can be a portion of the biomass, we take it and we convert it into the recalcitrant or fixed carbon, and that actually and then put it into the soils, and the idea behind that is we're actually taking that carbon out of the normal carbon cycle. At this point in time, we're putting a lot of carbon up into the atmosphere. Um, so, so biochar um, is, is essentially locking up and is sequestering carbon in, into the soils. It's at a very, very small scale at the moment, but the, the fundamental design behind biochar is, is a, um, about locking um, or sequestering carbon. One of the benefits, um, and that's, that's uh, part of a lot of research um, going on in Australia, um, is, is the, the analysis of, of that whole cycle of biomass. Um, it, it does get horrendously complex and it's not my, my area of expertise. Um, there's, there's other benefits in the, in the production of, of biochar. There's bio oils, there's syn gases which you can possibly produce. Um, heat, heat, heat exchange energy. Uh, there's, there's lots of interesting um, developments within, within the technology. Um, pyrolysis is a um, thermochemical decomposition of organic biomass at elevated temperature in the absence of oxygen. So we generally we apply heat to the biomass in some way without lots of, lots, lots of oxygen. That stops the oxidisation of the biomass so it doesn't burn through to ash. Um, and, and in general, the, the process um, is interrupted with, with, with moisture or quenching. Um, so that's fairly common. There's, um, the two types of technology that I've basically worked with is, is this is Russell Burnett um, system. This is a, what we call a continuous flow um, um, pyrolyzation system. So the biomass comes in, in here, and then in this case it's poultry litter. 
So that's poultry manure and, and the, the shavings from the floors. So this is commercial scale poultry, uh, poultry litter. Um, so that's heated up to 220 degrees. Then it drops through and runs through an auger and that's at 550 degrees. So that's applied heat. So as the biomass is travelling through a tube with an auger, the heat's applied to the outer, outer tube. You're sort of like now thinking, okay, well where do you get all that energy? What happens when you apply that heat is you get volatile compounds coming out of that, out of that biomass. Those volatile compounds have a lot of um, energy in, them, in, them, in themselves. Um, that, that, those gases are scrubbed, so we, we go through, we actually capture in this process um, a lot of compounds and being poultry manure they the high nitrogen compounds um, then we take that syngas once it's been uh, scrubbed and cleaned and it goes to the other side of the machine and it goes into a furnace so that furnace runs at 900 degrees um, the heat from that furnace goes into the, the secondary pyrolysis chamber um, and then moves through flows through that pipe into the, into the early dryer Excess, that all the energy produced isn't used in this process. Excess energy is plumbed in and, and can be applied into um, the generation of, of um, electrical energy or, or motion energy. Um, so this is one, one type of, of current Australian technology. Um, so this is a, a diagram showing um, how the biomass comes in um, and the different ways of where the, where the gases travel and um, are cleaned, yeah, excess energy. Um, the system's the size of a bus. It's, it's for, for the production of, of syngases and, and, um, and bioenergy, it's, it's complicated, but it's also quite simple in, in, in its design. And this, what's the, um, the biochar production like from there? Mm -hmm. Well, I can answer. Uh, uh, yeah, just that, that generally keep questions till the end of the presentation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just but the, the, that, 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 that machine is a prototype and um, it's about 50 kilos an hour, so it's quite small. Um, from from the, the, the prototype technology and the developers which I've been working with, um, I've developed a series of products around that. So my background being as a gardener, as an organic um, enthusiast, as a permaculturalist, was how can I um, take biochar and make it available because the only, only, only groups in Australia that had access to it were the scientific organisations and uh, the, the major supplier of biochar in Australia was selling it at seven and a half thousand dollars a tonne. So um, I, I did some deals and I was able to take, take um, the poultry, poultry litter based biochar and I've created um, a series of products. Um, so I offer gardeners uh, um, a, um, the, the biochar as a pure pure biochar um, as, a, as a product which is blended with compost that's animal animal based composts that's fully composted that's a really good quality ag agricultural grade compost it's not something that I um, make in my bins at home which is much better anyway but um, and biochar max which um, is a mineral compounds um, nitrogen sort of type fertilisers. That's more conventional or crossover type fertilisers. That um, is focused at, at the organic side of things. Um, touching on the organics, um, I've had a lot of things out of, out of my control using prototype technology, um, other, other people's sites and so forth, which has made organic certification of the product very difficult. Um, this is now changing um, and I'm actually moving production onto my own farm. Um, and I'm moving away from poultry litter and, and moving into um, clean um, plantation offcuts um, from, from pallet manufacturing. Um, so it's a, it's a pure waste product. Um, and, and that's the, the business allows, because it's small, I can be flexible, I can look, at, look for the most sustainable feedstocks um, and, and, and processing um, at, at, this, at a very small sort of boutique level. Uh, it's an interesting history um, with, with biochar. Uh, the, the soils found in the Amazon um, are what they call, the, the locals call terra preta, um, terra preta nova. Um, the terra preta um, actually translates in Portuguese to black earth and that's where I got the name of the company. 
Um, a few of the scientists around have been lucky enough to actually jump on planes and fly over to, to, to the Amazon. Um, and some of the sites are very, very protected. The, there's a lot of stories about um, the, the discovery of the black soils in, in the Amazon. The, the, the soil there is generally a, a, a quite an unfertile clay um, material. So these, these areas of black soil, um, which I think they initially were looking at um, possible volcanic sources or they really weren't sure. So um, doing profile cuts through the landscape to see how far down it went, um, they discovered pottery shards. In some of these, some of these areas, the, the soil went down two metres deep. So bone, pottery shards. Uh, so it's, it's civilization that's created these amazing black fertile soils. Um, if, if, if anyone here <coughs> grows their own home-based um, organic soils, you know how long it takes for your, your soil to start, start rising. It takes a long time. So for, for anyone to actually have two metres, or to, to produce or develop two metres of, of soil is a remarkable uh, feat. And, uh, but it, it was done over a very, very long time. The, um, the, the Spanish who went up uh, the, uh, the, the Amazon and, and found the, the, uh, the, the cities um, which glistened in white, which, which was actually a limestone, on, a lime wash on the buildings. Um, they actually, unfortunately left some rather nasty um, diseases and within a generation they pretty well killed off the entire population. Um, so when they went back, it was, none of it was there. But it has been, um, sites all through the Amazon have been found. I'd love to get a bucket, bucket of it and put it in my garden. Uh, I just the BBC um, documentary uh, "The Secret of El Dorado" is is worth hunting down, and it is available to, to view online. Um, when I went to the uh, to the conference in Turrigal in 2007, I think everyone in the conference had seen the documentary and uh, over half of the people were actually in the room because they watched that documentary. It, it's, it's quite an inspiring documentary. There's been another one just recently. Um, um, it's a, it's a based, based around the Amazon civilization, but that's definitely something to look up. It's an hour long doco, but really worth, worth watching. Um, I'm not sure if, if charcoal is still made in, in earth, earth pits in, in New Zealand. It certainly is in Australia. Um, <coughs> this is one of the battles that I've, I've had within Australia, um, is there is some, still some very large charcoal manufacturers. They take timber, fallen timber, um, and I use the word fallen very loosely, off from farms, um, collect it up, put it into a earth pit. So. Um, they take a, a D9 bulldozer, they, they basically um, cut into the ground, they, they bulldoze the, the timber trucked in, it's done on a big scale, put tin over it, put earth on it, set it on fire, no emissions control, um, and, and that was what, um, well they produce lump, lump charcoal for barbecues and, and that sort of thing. Part of the process is um, what we call fines. It's just small, small particles which are produced out of the industry, and they've decided to jump on the biochar bandwagon. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of that sort of thing. I don't think it's. An, I think it's an unsustainable source. I think the process it's polluting, and and the the product that they're producing isn't focused in on 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 horticulture. It's just a byproduct. Um, it, it's generally um, what we call uh, hydrophobic, so it actually repels water, so it doesn't naturally absorb into, into, the, into the soil profile. I've seen, seen some rice hull biochars um, from Asia and within, well compared to other, other biochars, after two, three years they're still sitting on the soil profile where they should be completely incorporated. So not all biochars are equal, not by a long way. Um, some different ways um, of, of making biochar. This is a, a very good friend of mine, Dr. James Joyce. 
Um, he's involved with um, um, continuous uh, flow gasification systems. Um, the unit yield is based on the back of a truck. Um, James no longer does it. They, they, they're a container-based unit and the, um, the emissions controls use, the, the term is a, a cyclonic thermal oxidizer. Um, so the, the idea is any volatiles which are produced from the, the process um, go into a big container, swirl around burner, and then the only emissions that you get out of a system like that is water vapour and CO2. And CO2 would be released normally if that biochar was left to rot on the ground anyway, so there's no net increase in emissions. Um, this is a bit of a diagram of um, some of the different waste streams or, or off, offshoots that you can um, produce with um, um, a technology like James's. Um, so different types of possible feedstocks. Feedstocks can come in the way of um, poultry, poultry, poultry litter, um, any sort of agricultural biomass. As long as you, it's dry, um, you have to take the moisture content out. So generally anything un, under 25% moisture content. Um, material handling is, as soon as you start going into a larger scale volume, material handling um, is always uh, difficult and, and it's always an expensive exercise. So getting that right um, with, with these sort of processes is, takes a lot of work. Um, so the core technology, which is the unit on the back of the truck you just saw, um, the, the unit itself uh, can produce up to 950 degrees of, of thermal temperature. So you can use that thermal temperature um, to, to, to be applied into a whole host of um, industrial um, applications. There's, there's brick kilns need lots of heat. There's drying of timber. Uh, there's many industries around which need um, heat energy. The, the heating of, of, of hot water to, to wash um, chicken carcasses or eggs or uh, there's, there's, there's lots of industrial applications and any sort of system like this paired with, with a, a suitable industrial partner is definitely the smart way, way to go. From my point of view, the, the unit can also generate um, electricity um, between two and six hundred kilowatts um, is is sort of the area with with that sort of unit at, at about 1.2 tons of biomass going into it an hour. So that that unit on the back of the truck would produce about 300 kilos of biochar. So the the, the what I call carbonised biomass or biocarbon, and then that sort of breaks into um, two sort of fields from my, my sort of side of things. One is the soil improver, um, the other starts going into activated carbon, heating, uh, pallets, um, coal displacement, um, liquid fuel production. Um, that I'm very, not, not much of an expert with, with that, but um, James Joyce is, is very smart within that, within that area. Um, uh, that's just a shot of his unit, um, 2200 unit. Uh, James has done a lot of work within the Australian sugarcane industry, which is huge. Um, so there's, there is a lot of byproducts produced as part of that. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the sugarcane industry. A lot of times, when when they harvest or pre-harvest, actually burn through the harvest to get rid of the snakes, or burn burn the the, the, the material after harvesting. Um, and I've gone through cane growing regions and it's just like a sea, a sea of or smog of smoke off the field. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, not particularly environmentally friendly from my point of view. Um, some of the byproducts, obviously, uh, which I touched on is the cogeneration for grid power production. Um, if you've got uh, a smaller, smaller towns where they're using um, diesel generators, um, then, then these sort of systems can, uh, the, the smaller sort of gasifiers can come into their own, um, um, tee them up with um, small genset or, or uh, technology which we use as organic rank and soil. Um, that's not my area. Um, the syngas from different types of technologies can be used as well. Um, scrubbing um, 
is always an issue. There's a lot of particulate matter um, or can be um, generated through these sort of processes. So cleaning those up for gas, gas engine generation is it, or can be um, problematic. Um, the liquid, liquid pyrolysis, the condensate, it's an interesting stuff. I've done a fair bit of work with it um, and growth trials. Um, it can be refined into bio oils. Um, the, the growth trials that I did with, with poultry litter condensate. Um, so that's, that's um, the uh, taking the smoke which is produced from the process, you, you, you move that smoke through a cooler um, area and it creates uh, condensation. So that's where the term condensate come from, comes from. So, and, but the, the, the problems that, that we have with that material is it's horrendously complex. Uh, 250 different chemical compounds um, and identifying them is a horrendously complex task. Um, the, the Japanese have done a lot of work with bamboo con condensates and they've actually got some products um, um, I think it's Malaysia uh, called Bam, um, Panda uh, condensate um, which they use as a, um, a fungicide or there's all sorts of things which I've, that I've been doing with it and I had some pretty interesting results from, from growth trials with it but I'm moving away from that now I, I think it's, it's for, for, the, for the scale that it's produced and how complex the material is, um, you, to move into a bio oil production region, you have to do it on a massive scale to compete with the petrochemical com companies. Um, so, from my point of view, just I had to put it in the too hard basket. Now for the good stuff. <laughs> um, this is my my first attempt at. Um, at bio, or not one, one of my earlier attempts at uh, biochar production. So this is a, a gasifier with um, a batch pyrolyzer that I put on top of it. So all, all the good stuff's on the inside and the ugliness is on the outside. Um, used a, a, a vacuum cleaner on reverse to blow and that actually blew air through to, to make the unit run. Um, the, the, the system ran cleanly without smoke um, most of the time. Um, occasionally you would lose ignition, it would belch smoke out and then you'd get a spark and then you'd have about two metres of flame pouring out the top. <laughs> um, my, my friend who's a, um, an engineer, and we had some fun with this, um, I, I turned around one day and he was looking down trying to figure out what was going on and I, I grabbed him by the shirt, pulled him back and then it ignited. So I saved his hair by about <laughs> that much. <laughs> Um, this is the, 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 um, the giver, um, or as my neighbour called it, the bomb. Um, I had an interesting story where the first time I ever, ever um, ran the unit um, and had, didn't have a, a really good understanding of what to expect. Um, I knew um, heating up this I was going to be um, creating what we call an exothermic reaction. So you get around about between 400 and 450 degrees, I was going. Your volatiles was going to start breaking with the carbon um, at a rate which I wasn't expecting. Um, <laughs> and um, when, when this, just as this, 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 the system went exothermic, um, my my father-in-law turns up in his brand new Lexus and parks right next to that. Gets out of his car, looks at me. I'm lying under this taking photos. Photo. And then he gets back into his car and just drives <laughs> and just puts the car about 50 metres away from, from what I was doing. I've actually got a, I've got a, uh, a video on, on here um, of the unit running and it literally sounds like a rocket when it's, when it's going. It's quite scary. Um, the later photos you'll see fl uh, flame marks all up the, the, the white ceramic um, insulation on the outside. Uh, but it was... <laughs> <coughs> yeah, there, there's, the, there's the burn mark. So uh, when the system is heated up to 450 degrees, you get a rapid expansion of the amount of volatiles in, in the system. They, they, they actually overwhelm the unit. And then about five minutes later, it starts to settle down, and then it'll run for about 
an hour and a half to two hours, depending on the material, um, quite, quite nicely. That'll do logs. That was the benefit of that unit. Um, but I've since moved away from, from that for various reasons of safety and insurance to um, gas for gas of batch gasifiers. Batch gasifiers, from my point of view, for anyone interested in, in producing their own biochar at home, are uh, other way to go, by, by a long shot. But they're safe, um, you can put them out when, when they are then no processing. The unit before is like a hard fuel rocket. When that thing goes, there's nothing you can do. That is just going to run. Um, and uh, you, you lose ignition, there's all sorts of problems with, with that, where this you can just take the top off, hit it with a hose and put it out. And, but it's still not necessarily 100% um, safe. The, this is a, an earlier, early unit. The, the plans for all of these are all online. It's an open source project which I've developed. Um, I take technology from, um, well, I asked James Joyce, who's a, um, a doctor within gasification technology, and he throws back um, lots of ideas. And then I, um, being a backyard engineer, apply those ideas. Um, and the idea is to create a safe, um, low emission system, which doesn't do that. Uh, that is um, uh, uh, classmate as a friend, an associate um, in North, northern New South Wales called, um, for Australian, Waza. Um, 30 seconds after that photo was taken, that exploded. That, that emptied the entire contents of that drum. Um, the smoke that you see, the white smoke, that's highly volatile. That has the volatility of petrol. So the heat lost um, ignition or in, in that system, flame ignition. So then it started pumping out huge amounts of, of smoke. And then he, then he got a spark in there. There was enough oxygen and boom. So it was rather exciting. Uh, the, this is a, a larger, uh, a larger um, version of my fat boy gasifier. Um, so this is a, a 44 gallon drum, but there's an inner chamber in here which, which um, the, the whole process happens. Um, I've, I've written a fairly extensive page and a lot of photos on, on, the, uh, on the process and how, how the whole, whole unit goes, goes together. The inner, inner chamber, which is in this, um, is, is I generally try and make, or have made out of stainless steel or pilfer from the local tip shop, which is my favorite hangout. And then I build the unit around that stainless steel chamber. Um, the, the unit from there was a small pressure cylinder. The unit inside there, or the, 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 the chamber inside there, is actually a stainless steel um, pool filter pump or the, the, the outer chamber. So, um, and both of those were free from, from friends because they all know I'm chasing stainless steel. Um, this is a, um, a, a much smaller version of, of this sort of design. This is a, um, a biochar stove, or the, it's called a champion stove. Or the, 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 the official term is a T-LUD, which is top lit updraft gasifier. Um, the, the idea behind um, the development of these stoves is in um, developing third world countries a lot of the food that is produced is produced on open fires so the, they're in their huts they're cooking on open fires, the huts are full of smoke the, usually the women who do the cooking are, um, have to breathe in um, a lot of, lot of smoke, they get lung cancer and they die at a very early age a lot of children in the huts with them die at a very early age because of lung cancers and, and associated problems. So the idea is um, we, we give them um, a very, very low cost stainless steel uh, stove. They can cook on that. Um, and in, instead of the smoke belching up, they actually cook on the flame, which is, which is actually from the, the burning of the smoke. And that's the idea of a gasifier. Um, so there's very, very low emissions with that. Um, I, I bought one of those and I've since then, um, sell, sell them in Australia. Um, but being the backyard engineer, I've, I've having more heavily modified it to actually make make it run more efficient um, with flu modifications and, and the like. I sort of can't help myself with that sort of thing. Um, this, uh, what what can happen 
When, when you um, produce biochar, the, the material um, coming out is hot, um, very, very hot, and you need to quench it. Um, I think that also improves the, um, the, the, the structure of the biochar as water jets through the, 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 the char that you've made. Um, it actually increases the porous surface, steam jets through all, all of that biomass. And it also means when, once you've kept it kept, uh, wet, you don't have um, dust issues um, and, and the like. Um, but um, just after making a batch of biochar, I get the call to go in for dinner. <laughs> I, I didn't quite quench enough. Come, come back uh, in, in half an hour. And because all the volatiles are all being driven off, the, 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 the biochar that I've produced doesn't actually create any smoke or anything, just burns once, once the oxygen gets to it. Um, so, but being, being a permaculturalist, I just layered that through my compost and um, added, added a sort of a potash type material. So nothing goes to waste. And it was a good lesson. Um, I live on uh, 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 next to a lake. Uh, it's where, so it's a, it's a wonderful resource for biomass. Um, where everyone sort of sees weeds, being a typical permaculturalist, I see a resource. Um, so the Sylvania doesn't make the best biochar um, because you've got to dry it out. You've actually got to get in the lake and put it in the wheelbarrow and then put it into a bulk bag and drag it up to the shed and then spend four weeks trying to dry it out um, when dumping it onto your garden beds is much, much easier. Um, but it's all about experimenting and having fun. Um, I've done a lot of my own pot trials. Um, I've done um, a fair bit of work with Queensland University, the Gatton campus. Um, so my background isn't in horticulture, horticulture um, but I'm, I've been able to get the right advice to be able to do some of these trials myself. Um, they are based on more visual uh, information, not so much weight. Um, and this is exactly what I mean. Um, this is a, um, a photo showing um, my home produced biochar and the, the black earth products, the poultry litter biochar. This is sort of just showing you that not all biochars are equal and, and how well they work, work together. Um, this is a, a, a pretty stark um, example of how biochar works um, in, in the soils. Um, control, this is oats. Um, now, biochar by itself in the soils isn't a fertiliser. It's about structural improvement, holding nutrient and mineral exchanging with the plants. So it, it's not a, not a, 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 a manure fertiliser or, or anything like that. So eight grams of biochar as much as be a teaspoonful and a litre of, of potting, potting mix. So very little difference between, between those two, two shots. Um, in this case, the, the condensate, which is, um, can be sort of seen as a liquid nitrogen fertiliser. Um, so there's, there's an imp, imp, uh, increase in growth which has happened from, from the control. But the real standout is here you see that biochar and the liquid fertiliser um, together have a stark um, change in, in, you can see the difference. Um, I'll, I'll step back so you can see from the control, um, biochar by itself, the, the, the fertiliser, this is all grown in a, in a standard um, off the shelf seed raising mix, which had two or three grains of fertiliser, which you can see, I think one of them turned up in the control on the left there, of course, to upset my photos, but anyway. But you can also see the massive increase in root mass in, in, in those. Um, which is really important as well. It's not all just about what's on the top, so often it's more about what's underneath. So in, in, in this example, if, if you um, take that, that condensate and you put organic fertilisers in there, you put composts in there, poultry manure, um, triple ten conventional fertilisers, um, that's that's um, what you can sort of expect. And as, as you all see in, in the, I've got a, twel a 12, um, 12 different 
styles of, of, of trial, you can see that in increases the, in the fertilizer, um, but with still only a small amount of biochar, um, you can get some really, really good growth in increases. Um, biochar inoculation. This is really, really important uh, for, for those biochars made at home, especially the units and the, and the gasifiers. Um, anything you make at home, I would always put through a compost. Um, it, it's, it's hard to get rid of all the volatile compounds. When you go through um, a, a gasifier, um, or if, if you're going to use wood coals from your fires, or anything like that, um, the, um, the volatile compounds in there are not all, always beneficial for your soils. Um, can take your, your soils and, and put them out of whack. Um, where if you put them through um, a compost system, layer them through as you make your compost, um, the, the intense activity of, of the microbial um, life in your, in your compost will help break down and stabilise any sort of um, almost dangerous um, chemicals um, that are produced in the timber. Um, make sure it's dampened in a, in a wheelbarrow. Um, it's a good way to take your frustration down. Um, this is a, um, a sludge mix. So I have a 44 gallon drum. Um, all sorts of nasty, or organic, smelly compounds and, and cane toads and roadkill and anything else I want to throw in there. That sits there for six months. It ends up, as I, as I produce the biochar, half full of biochar. Um, at the very end of it, I actually uh, aerate it, add molasses, um, so it, it goes from, um, or it turns into an aerobic uh, mix. I then drain off the liquid, um, thin that down, apply that around the trees, um, and the sludge goes around the trees, mulch goes over the top of it. Um, so. My hands usually smell for about four days after that. Um, one of the things, uh, and it's a really good organic indicator with biochar or heavily biocharred soil, is worm activity. Um, Alfred will, will um, back me up on this. When, when I first started my orchard, it was, it was hard work trying to find a worm. Uh, my, my vegetable gardens are you, you pull back the mulch, you have initial bouncing of, 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 of life and then the worms are, are in abundance in very black, highly carbonous soil now. So it, it's an indicator that it's not a, not, not a negative process. It's not the only thing I put in. I, I do use organic pr processes, composts, minerals, rock minerals, um, liquid seaweeds, mulching. Um, I'd use no-till, um, so I don't turn my soils. Um, I did when I first, first set it up because it was in a horse paddock and it was rock hard. Um, for agricultural especially, uh, soils really need to be uh, analysed um, before biochar is applied. Uh, it's not so important with, with home sites. Um, Application rates um, between one and five ton per hectare, up to ten tons. Um, it really depends on your soils. Uh, my um, being in the industry and and, and uh, the realities of, of dealing with biomass and, and production of of fertilisers or organic fertilisers is biochar. I think should be applied. For, for horticultural application at a, at a lower amount, but each year, so you slowly build it up. It doesn't need to be hit one, one, one big um, um, five ton per hectare load. So you end up creating a series of products which um, you gradually increase the, 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 the fixed carbon to your soils. Um, but that said, you, you can inoculate it and add it in, in one hit. Australia's leading soil scientist with, with in, in biochar, uh, Lucas Van, Van Wee, Sweden, Sweden uh, believes that bank the buck, you just whack it on and then inoculate it, um, where I'm inoculate it and, and add it slowly over time. So um, 
we just have to agree to disagree with that one. Um, there's, there's a lot more information on Black Earth products with regards to um, application rates. That is very much focused on my commercial products, which are all based in Australia. Biochar.net, that's sort of my blog, and, and it's also information with regards to um, um, biochar and the biochar industry. Um, plans from my fat boy gasifier, um, and photos, and lots of notes. Um, and also the, the, the gibber, which I'd suggest you not um, build. Um, are all on there. It, it's just, it's, all, it's about my journey, lots of photos, um, and as, as research and, and information come up, um, that's, that's where, I'll, where I'll post it. Um. Oh, no, a the biochar, because it's a permanent additive to your soil, it is about the long-term improvement of, of agricultural or horticultural soils. It's a, it's a major problem within horticulture and agriculture, the loss of soil carbon. So uh, adding, adding biochar, and some of the biochars can last up to 5,000 or potentially 5,000 years. Um, data on, on, on that, that sort of time frame is coming out of the Australia's main organise, uh, science organisation, which is the CSIRO. Um, don't ask me exactly how they do that, but they have some pretty expensive pieces of equipment which, is, which are allowing them to, to guesstimate those sort of time frames. Um, biochar applied to soils shows you can reduce the amount of fertilisers that you're using in the environment and you're getting the same sort of um, growth rate. So things like nitrogen leaching into waterways is a major problem. Um, it's also an expense to farmers. So if, if you have a high, a good level of biochar in there, you can reduce your fertilizer use um, by 50% from that point onwards. Um, matching, matching biochar with some really interesting biological um, processes could reduce the fertilizer ap application down even lower. Biochar um, reduces irrigation needs, which I don't think really is a major issue in this part of the world, apparently. Um, it's, it's shown aeration um, benefits with clay soils. It, it, it holds nutrients and, um, and actually improves <coughs> water, water retention in sandy soils. Um, there's obviously the, the nitrous oxide and methane emissions <laughs> reductions. Um, there's a lot of potential feedstocks, and it's just, um, you've got to think outside of the box with regards to um, where your potential feedstocks come in. Um, the biochar industry got hit by, um, there's a group in the UK called um, uh, Fuel, Watch, Fuel Watch, um with regards to the biochar industry, because earlier on a few people said, I said, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll basically start harvesting the world's forests, turn it into, um, biochar, put it into the soils um, and we'll claim lots of carbon, carbon credits and, and so forth which is just crazy, crazy talk and, and that's never going to happen within, within this industry. Uh, it's, it's a long, long way. And there's, there are so, so many potential feedstocks out there. There's so many waste products. Uh, Wolfgang was throwing some <coughs> huge numbers about the, the amount of waste biomass from plantation timbers. Um, out there. Um, my, my main focus from this point forward is to take off cuts from um, a, a company that makes pine pellets. So the pine for the pellets um, comes from plantation timbers. They have lots of little nicely shaped wooden off cuts. They produce 30 tonnes a week of, of those off cuts. Um, that currently is taken elsewhere, is mulched and turned into a mulch which then sits on the soil and generally within six months in Queensland breaks down and re-releases back into the atmosphere where I can take it and turn it into um, biochar which will last a thousand years or two thousand years. So it is literally about thinking outside of the box and finding, finding those potential feedstocks, um, finding partner industries with, with the technology. Um, there's a lot of people on, online who have gasifiers and they've hooked up hot water systems within the, within the flue. So it, it can, the, 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 the technology can be taken and, and, and applied, in, 
occupied into um, into the backyard. Um, I think if I was living in this environment, I would have a um, a gasifier, which the flue actually came inside my house and and would be heating. Um, it's not such a um, an issue in Queensland. Um, so drying out dead cane toads, maybe. But yeah. Yeah. No, that's it. Mm. Uh, and that's all. So.